Every single year, national parks have over 4,000 search and rescue missions. I thought that that was a, a little bit high. I started researching a little bit of these, uh, you know, basically these search and rescue missions that take place every year. And it is millions and millions of dollars that are spent over and over again to find hikers who have lost their way. Uh, which means that thousands of times that hikers believe that it is no big deal to go a little bit off the path. They believe that they can find their own way. These are individuals who believe that they know what is better than the signs that are telling them the direction or the path to stay on. Now, we understand that of these 4,000 a year, that that's not every case, but it is the majority of the cases, and less than 1% uh, are the search and rescue missions not successful. But the idea here is that there are reasons that there are signs, and there are reasons that there are marked trails for the hiker to stay on. It is for the good of the hiker, and it is for the safety of all who are involved. And here is the idea, is that most hikers do not realize the danger of the wilderness, nor do they realize the severity of not staying on the designed path that was created for them. It is the same for the Christian life. It's the same for you and I. It's the same that you and I would cling to the things of God in the direction that he is sending us, the direction that he is calling us within the design that he has structured for us. Every hiker needs a guide. Every hiker needs to understand the design of the path. And every follower of Jesus needs a guide. Every follower of Jesus needs a leader in order to guide them. And you and I have a greater leader. This is not just any leader. Because most of the time when you and I think about leaders, we think about the generals of the past, the ones who have stormed the beaches, the ones who have gone out and, and found the, the world's most wanted and, and brought them to justice. We think about these types of leaders. This is essentially where I go to most of the time. When I think about a good leader, I'm thinking about a general who has the command of his army, the command of his soldiers, the ears of the people who are following them. And this is, in essence, an idea of what a good leader is. But you and I are not in need of a general. All of us, we are in need of a Savior. This is Jesus Christ himself, who is our greater and greatest leader ever known to man. He is the one alone who is worthy of our worship. He alone is worthy of our full surrender. We do not need a leader in our nation that is just dominating, domineering, not one that is the most loud or has the best argument, but rather we need a leader who is uh, the one that describes himself as lowly and gentle at heart. Jesus is the leader that we are all desperate for, and the leader we need is that. You know, it's interesting that uh, Pew Research put out a recent study that said that 65% of Americans said that most political candidates run for office only to serve their own personal agendas. There is a lack of trust in leadership. There's a lack of trust in authority. In fact, among Western society, the authority is no longer considered a positive word. It is no longer considered a good thing, that no one should have authority. That's the idea. This is where our society has ultimately arrived, is that leaders cannot be trusted, authority should not be given. Authority is a threat. Authority will be misused. Authority will be used to manipulate people. This is an idea of Western society that people have come to. 
But what if we understood authority differently? What if you and I understood authority in terms in the way that the Bible describes it, that authority is actually given to individuals by God himself for the purpose of God? That authority is actually a gift from God rather than a threat to God's people. And you and I, we can live according to this standard because our understanding of life, our lens of authority, and our understanding of leadership does not come from the world, and it is not destroyed by leaders of the world, but rather we have a lens to understand it with Scripture, by the grace of God and by the mercy of God, that we would understand leadership, we would understand authority by God's standard alone. And this is where Hebrews 13 goes. We saw in Hebrews 13, 1 through 6, that it is all about love. How can we love each other well inside the church? How can we love strangers outside the church? How can we love those who are in desperate need of our compassion? And those who could never repay us, how can we love the least of these, the the marginalized? How can we love those who we would often consider unlovable? How can we love people who drive us crazy? And then he turns to all of us and our understanding of not just about love in the church and from the church, but leadership and our response to leadership in the church. In Hebrews 13, 7 through 19, we see that we are called to follow a greater leader who is Jesus himself, and we are given an understanding of how this should be accomplished and structured within the church among God's people. And so I want to invite you, if you have your Bible, would you Open to Hebrews 13, and if you're willing and able, would you stand with me as we just read this passage together? If you don't have your own Bible or a copy of God's Word, there's a Bible in front of you that you can have. It is our gift uh, from, from Green Acres to you. And this is what it says, according to the Lord in Hebrews 13, 7 through 19. It says, remember your leaders who have spoken God's Word to you. As you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be established by grace and not by food regulation, since those who observe them have not benefited. We have an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing his disgrace. For we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one to come. Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share. For God is pleased with such sacrifices. Obey your leaders and submit to them since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would not be profitable, unpro- that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience, wanting to conduct ourselves honorably in everything, and I urge you all the more to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. Let's pray. God, would you help us understand your word. God, would you direct my voice? Would you direct our ears for me to say what is only of you, for us to hear what is only of you? God, so that we may honor you and glorify you in everything that we do. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated once again. You can see that Three different times through this passage, we're going to 
see this idea of leadership. We're going to see the idea of what it means to be a leader within the church. And so we go from love as the foundation to leadership as an outpouring of that love. You don't begin with leadership in this discussion, but rather you begin with the foundation of love. The writer does this on purpose for us. He does this on purpose so that we know that it is a structure to formulate love, not to dominate people. That's not God's design for leadership. Never does Jesus say that you should dominate people in your life. You should not dominate your spouse. You should not dominate your children. You should not dominate anyone in your business. You should not dominate uh, those around you or those in the church. This is not God's design for leadership. A domineering personality is not a fruit of the Spirit. A dominating uh, a conversation is not a fruit of the Spirit. Us being domineering in nature toward others is not a fruit of the Spirit, nor should it be seen in anyone's leadership. Instead, when you start with the foundation of love, love should inform the way you lead people. In every aspect of your life, Love informs our interactions with people. Difficult conversations that you have to have starts with a foundation of love. Difficult moments in your marriage starts with a foundation of love. Difficult seasons in your parenting starts with a foundation of love. And everything we do in the church is from a foundation and understanding of love. But it's not the superficial love that the world prescribes or that it attaches itself to. But rather, it is the unchanging love of God himself that directs all things that happen within the church and that flow from the church. But what about our structure? What about these leaders What about the structure of the church and how we should function in love together? The writer helps us, and he begins with recognizing a timeless leadership. He says first, in a commanding way, he says, remember um, your leaders, Verse 7, remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. You know, you and I uh, have an incredible honor and privilege that we can remember those who have come before us. I don't know if you know this or not, the history of our church, but since 1955, we have only had six senior pastors. Uh, The first was Cecil Johnson, who served Green Acres for eight years. The second was Lester Collins, who served the church for about three years. And then it was Ed Bowles, who served the church for about seven years. Then the Lord called Paul Powell, who came and served the church for 17 years. And then a man named David Dykes came and served this body of believers faithfully for 30 years. And what the Bible is telling us to do is he is saying, remember your leaders, those who have gone before us and who have paved the way for us. But he doesn't just say to remember in some uh, just quick and easy way. He doesn't say to remember all leaders. He says, remember the leaders of the church. Contextually, what the writer is speaking to is not the leaders of Rome. It's not the leaders of Israel. It's not the leaders of the religious system. He is saying, remember your leaders who have gone before you within the church. And he says in verse 6, as a reminder, the writer says, therefore... We may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. 
What can man do to me? He ends there in verse six last week. And then today he says, now remember the leaders who lived with this in mind, who led in this way, not fearing man, but rather only fearing God himself. Leaders who have this foundational understanding of love and fear that is righteous before God. We are all called to remember the leaders who spoke God's word to us. Every single person in this room, you most likely can remember a leader who has spoken God's word to you. And not only do they speak God's word, but they live out God's word. Do you see the... What the members of the church are called to do, they are called to remember, but as you carefully observe or examine the outcome of their life. This is not like some type of blind remembrance here that, oh yeah, uh, they were great in the past, sure, all of that. No, he says to remember them as you look at the outcome of their lives, the ones who have spoken God's word over you and the ones who have lived out God's word before you. He says, remember those leaders. And we know that even though that pastors come and go, here's a tethering point for us in verse 8. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is a reminder that God's way is better than our way. This is a reminder that even though leaders may change around us, God remains the same. Jesus Christ remains the same. And the leaders of the past are only as good as their abiding to Christ himself. And not just leaders of the past, but leaders today and leaders tomorrow are only as good as their binding to the spirit of God himself. In the midst of this, he is reminding us that, yes, leaders come and go, but Jesus remains because the church will keep moving forward. And this is why he tells us in verse 9, he says, don't be led astray. In the midst of all this, don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be established by grace and not by food regulation, since those who observe them have not benefited. See, the leaders of the past should be imitated and remembered only if they were holding people to the immovable Savior, to the unchanging Savior. Just as it was with the people in Hebrews, it is the same today that there will be and is a constant attack and attempt for us to move in every direction other than Christ himself. This is what the writer is talking about in verse 9. He says, be careful. It doesn't matter who the leader is. You make sure you are not being led astray by various strange teachings, teachings that will make you go to the left or to the right. And so you can't not just have this type of a blind remembrance and blind honor and say, well, the pastor says, the pastor says this, so we got to do it. No, this is why he gives you the charge and says, no, make sure that whatever you are being taught is from the word of God. Everything else is rubbish in this life. Be sure, sure that you, as a godly member of the church, that you uphold the standard that what we hold on to, what we stand on, our foundation is the word of Christ himself. This is your job. This is your charge to make sure. You know, there are two things that church members are in charge of, that you are the final court of appeal in matters of doctrine and matters of discipline, you are the final court of appeal. This is why church membership matters. This is why church membership actually means something because you have to uphold doctrine and say, no, we will not be led astray. It doesn't matter who is in the pulpit, we will not be led astray as God's people. And this is a good charge. This is why... This is why, since 1955, this church continues to preach the gospel. It's because you are in charge of keeping it doctrinally sound. 
You hold the standard. But it's my job to make sure as a leader, it is my job to make sure that I'm doing everything possible in the way that Paul describes to Timothy. Second Timothy chapter two, verses 15 and 16. He says, be diligent. Be very careful. You better work your tail off to make sure that you present yourself to God as one approved. I want you to hear the tone here. This isn't like, hey, Timothy, you know what? If you feel like it, buddy, do your best. No, he's saying do everything in your power. Do everything in your might to be diligent, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. Live above reproach. Be full of the Spirit of God. Correctly teaching the word of truth. Avoid irreverent and empty speech since those who engage in it will produce even more godlessness. You know what the reminder for Timothy is? He says, yes, the members have the final court of appeal, but you better lead them in the right direction. You better do everything in your power to teach the word of God, rightly dividing it, being careful with your diligence, with your discipline, to make sure you're a man above reproach, that you're preaching with the passion of the gospel of Jesus Christ as a man of God. He says, be careful that you are doing these things. He puts the weight on Timothy. The timeless leadership is the one that is committed to teaching, committed to keeping and displaying the word of God. This is timeless because it keeps us ultimately committed to the timeless person of Christ himself. And this brings us to a distinct leadership. Hebrews 13, 15 says, therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. You see, Jesus is the only leader and ruler of this church. Jesus is ultimately the ruler over this body of believers. He alone is the leader we praise and whose name we confess. He alone is the one head of our church and every other New Testament Bible-believing, gospel-centered church. He alone, according to Ephesians 1.23, God the Father appointed Jesus as the head of the church. According to 1 Corinthians 3, Jesus is the foundation of the church. According to Ephesians 2.20, Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. According to 1 Peter 5.4, Jesus is the chief shepherd of the church. This is the design. Jesus is the greater leader who is ultimately over his church. However, according to God's design, he has set apart leaders on earth to rule under his authority and to lead under his charge. Leaders are not called to the world's definition, especially leaders in the church. Leaders in the church lead Jesus' church under his rule, under his authority, under his direction, for his purpose, and for his glory alone. And this type of leadership that moves God's people toward God's purpose and maintains a unique distinction from the rest of the world. You see, this is the idea of verses 10 through 16. It seems like random and strange and and, and impulsive expressions from the writer, but rather it is a continuation for us to recognize and understand the leadership that should be taking place within the church. Jesus calls us to have a distinction in our view of leadership and in the purpose of leadership as well as our response to leadership. Do not be carried away by false doctrine. Instead, it is for the purpose of being ushered into holiness. 
You see, this is why it is for our good that the Lord structures things according to his design. And this obsession that was so prevalent to his original Jewish audience with altars and with sacrifices and certain meals that deemed sacred. And once again, the writer is saying that leaders are to point them back to the work of Christ. This is what he does. He is pulling them back toward Jesus saying, no, that is not the way. This is the way that we should go. Therefore, walk in it. It's the same thing that we see over and over again through the book of Acts, that this is the way we should go. Therefore, we should walk in it. This is the idea and design of leadership in the church to point people back to the design of Jesus Christ himself. This is a primary discipline. This is a primary job. This should be on every job description of every pastor that your job is to lead people in the design of Christ himself for the purpose of Christ himself. And it's God's design for there to be over and over again. This is what we see, that God's design is that there is a clear leader and multiple leaders within the church who are called to be distinct in their leadership. Within the Bible, we see two offices in the church for the health, for the function, and for the structure of the church. The first office that we see is pastor or elder, and the second office that we see is deacon. The New Testament gives us a better understanding of who should be leading the church under the command of Christ. This is what we see in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Therefore, leaders are to be overseers. This is who the writer is referencing. When he is referencing leaders in the church, he is speaking specifically to pastors. Pastors are charged with meeting the spiritual needs of the church and leading the church under the command of Christ himself. Deacons help and assist the pastors of the church for the purpose of meeting the physical needs within the church. Paul again is addressing pastors by saying in Titus chapter 1 verses 7 through 9 he says as an overseer of God's household he must be blameless not arrogant not hot tempered not excessive drinker not a bully not greedy for money but hospitable loving what is good sensible righteous holy self-controlled holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be able to both encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. See, pastors of the church are called to lead toward distinction in all areas of the church, and her people will remain distinct and on mission for the glory and purpose of God. This is God's design for his church, but it also allows us to understand competent leadership. When you get to verse 17, this is where most people have a double take. This is where most people say, oh, well, it surely cannot mean what it says. In verse 17, it says, obey your leaders and submit to them since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. You see, this is completely countercultural in a world that stiff arms authority and stiff arms leadership and that ultimately stiff arms submission and obedience. I see it in my kids all the time. We are raised, uh, excuse me, we are born to stiff arm obedience. We are born to stiff arm words like submission and authority and oversight. We don't want those things. Why? Because we are autonomous human beings. I am individualistic. I don't need you to speak into my life. I certainly don't need you to lead me, and I certainly don't need to obey or submit to you. That is the posture of the world. 
But could it be that there is something different for the church? That the way that you and I interact together is a reflection of the Trinity itself. It is a reflection of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus, who was overall, that Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and who is the Lord of lords, found himself in a submissive role to the Father. And so we can't look at this and say, oh, well, I am too good to be submissive because Jesus Christ himself was submissive, and not just for any random purpose, but rather for your good, rather for my good, that because of the submissiveness of Christ himself to the plan of salvation from God the Father, that he would die on a cross, that he would become sin, so that you and I might have the righteousness of God. We cannot say, I am too good for obedience, and I am too good for submission. That is ungodly, and it is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the character of Jesus Christ himself. You see, God's design is always for our good. We cannot say, well, we've always done it like this, and this is the way that the world says we should do it. This is what this says. No, we have to say, what does the word of God say? And therefore, we walk in it. This is what the people of God do, and this is what good leaders call the people of God to do, so that we may flourish in the kingdom of God, not have suppressive natures or oppressive natures, but rather so that we may flourish in the kingdom of God and advance the kingdom of God together, that this is God's design of how we reach the world for Christ, and this is how we relate to each other for our benefit together and for the benefit of the gospel to move forward. We must be very careful in the way that we function as a church. We must be very careful in the way that we love each other according to God's structure and according to his design. And I'm going to tell you that what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, where he says, follow me or imitate me as I imitate Christ, I cannot tell you another verse that keeps me up late at night more than that. I want you to know this has been one of the hardest sermons to prepare for in my my short life, okay? (laughs) Because who am I to speak God's word to you? Who am I to call you to follow me? Let me assure you, I am not worthy. Let me assure you that I will fail you. Let me assure you that I will disappoint you at times. That I will let you down. I won't show up when I need to. I I won't say the things that I should at the right time. I won't react in the way that I should I am not worthy of you to follow me. All I want to do is what God's word says, and that is it. All I want to do is follow Jesus with every fabric of my life and with the most, uh, the, the surest at the smallest cellular level. I want to be submissive to Jesus Christ himself. And I promise you there are nights that I am awake, that I am praying over you. I'm praying over the direction of our church. I'm praying over the finances of our church. I'm praying over the staff of our church, the deacons of our church, the students of our church, the kids of our church, the next generation of leaders, the committees of our church, the older saints in our church. I am praying and I'm laboring on your behalf, not so that you will like me, not so that you will like the music, not so that you will like anything about what is going on, but so that you would be conformed to the image of Christ himself, because I am a keeper over your soul. And God has placed me in this way that I would do everything possible to lead you for your good and for the good of the kingdom of God. And I'm asking you to simply pray. That is it. He ends in this way. He says, 
in verse 18, pray for us. Because who can do it? It is only Christ. It is only Jesus. And praise God that he is ruler of this church. N.T. Wright says this. He says, insofar as the shepherds are doing their job, it is in the sheep's best interests to follow where they lead. This isn't patronizing the familiar charge today. It's common sense. Every Christian, every congregation needs to recognize that God does indeed call people to lead, teach, instruct, and warn the flock, and that it is better all round if this task can be done joyfully. I want to close by saying thank you for allowing me to serve you joyfully. I'm telling you, this is a special church that God's hand is on. And what I want to do is continue the legacy that has been started since 1955 because it's always been under the direction of the Holy Spirit and it will continue under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And what I'm asking of you is to pray. You know, to not get lost as a hiker in the mountains, it requires for you and for me to be healthy. It requires you to be a healthy church member. And what we see is that there's this calling that we would remember, that we would obey, that we would submit, and that we would pray. And as God's people, that's what we want to do, but it starts with your relationship with Jesus first. Our ultimate submission is to God himself. And maybe that is the decision that you need to make today to follow Jesus as we follow Jesus together in the structure and design that he has called us to. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you help us? God, would you help us to live in the way that you are calling us to live, Father, in full submission to you. God, as you rule our church, Father, would you allow us to understand our lane and our place in the way that we support your mission, your purpose, for your glory, and for the advancement of the kingdom. And I pray, God, right now for the individual that they're not a part of your mission because They're not in the family of God. I pray that right now, Lord, that you would draw their attention to this need in their life, that they first need you. God, I pray that today you will save people from our sins, knowing that Jesus Christ, being the same yesterday, today, and forever, is the only way of salvation. So, Father, would you speak to us now in that way? And, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would continue to lead every step and every way of this church. God, so that we may advance your kingdom together. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.